This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. According to the German Bild newspaper, the German ambassador in Afghanistan said that the Afghan government will lose control of the country within a year or two. In a report presented to his parliament, the German ambassador confirmed that the security situation in Afghanistan may lead to a disaster if security measures are not improved there. Moreover, he said that the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO forces, will not succeed in controlling the security situation in southern Afghanistan. The German parliament is expected to make Make a decision today on whether to extend the stay of its forces in Afghanistan for another year. The German forces have been deployed in Afghanistan as part of the NATO-led International Security Assistance Force (ISAF). In an attempt to curb the growing armed attacks in Afghanistan, NATO officials have agreed to extend the deployment of ISAF forces in the country and send 10,000 more troops to join U.S.-led coalition forces there. In joint military offensive operations, the Afghan army and U.S.-led coalition forces have killed hundreds of Taliban fighters in southern Afghanistan and other areas along the Pakistani borders, as confirmed by ISAF. ISAF announced that 140 coalition troops, mostly American, British, and Canadian, have been killed so far in armed attacks or clashes since January 2005. ISAF admitted that it had underestimated the capability of the Taliban fighters. Meanwhile, the Afghan president, Hamid Khan, Karzai urged ISAF to send more deployments to Afghanistan in an attempt to reinforce security prior to the upcoming elections. The redeployment of ISAF forces in southern Afghanistan two months ago has sparked fierce confrontations between these forces and Taliban fighters. In fact, coalition forces were engaged in the largest ground battle since their formation nearly six decades ago. Moreover, ISAF forces were hit hard in the region of Kandahar, where the Taliban downed a British chopper, killing 14 soldiers on board and downed another F-16 Dutch fighter. In addition, a bomb attack was launched against an ISAF military convoy in Kabul, killing several Italian soldiers. Also, a suicide bomb attack was launched against the Afghan government forces near the governor's office in the state of Helmand. According to sources affiliated with the U.S.-led coalition forces, the number of armed attacks against these troops has tripled, especially in regions along the Afghan-Pakistani borders, including Waziristan, Bakhtia, and Khost. NATO nations have stepped up security measures in Afghanistan to rein in the resistance, which is considered to be the fiercest since the collapse of the Taliban regime. Meanwhile, the Afghan president, Hamid Karzai, started a war of words with the Pakistani president, Barbez Musharraf, and both held the other responsible for the status quo. A spokesman from the United States Occupation Forces in Iraq said that last week witnessed the largest number of attacks since the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Most of these attacks targeted security forces. Major General William Caldwell told reporters that the number of attacks this week was higher than any other week and that more than half of these attacks targeted the security forces. The American occupation forces in Iraq announced that one of its soldiers was killed in the Ramadi west of the country. They released a statement saying that an American soldier from the 1st Division was killed by enemy fire, raising the number of Americans killed since the invasion of Iraq in 2003 to 2,704. 16 Iraqis were killed in separate attacks in cities throughout Iraq, including seven members of a single family during an American raid on a home in Baquba, northeast of Baghdad. This happened as the American occupation forces had claimed that they were exerting effort to avoid harming civilians while pursuing armed groups in Iraq.
لم تزل أعمال العنف تشكل العائق الأكثر تأثيرا في عقلة عوض Violence has made the living conditions more difficult and remains an obstacle preventing life from returning to normal in Iraq. Iraqis have accused American occupation forces of not doing enough to provide security and others have accused them of being behind the many terrorist operations that have claimed the lives of many Iraqis thus worsening the security situation. According to medical and security sources, American raid operations and an air strike killed eight people from one family and injured three others in Baquba city, 65 kilometers north of Baghdad. Eyewitnesses confirmed that occupation forces raided the area and killed the whole family, then remained in their home for three hours. They also confirmed that four women were among those who were killed. They surrounded the entire area, and then they brought armored vehicles and hammers. They surrounded the home and started shooting at it. Then they raided it and stayed there for three hours. They killed the people that were inside. Eight people were killed, four women and four men. A roadside bomb exploded near a police car transporting detainees in Baquba, killing four people, including two detainees. Two police officers were also injured. وفي بغداد قالت الشرطة إن قنبلتين زرعتا على جانب الطريق بغداد's police said that two roadside bombs exploded almost simultaneously in Al-Qarada city killing a passerby and injuring three others in a separate incident the sister of an Iraqi parliament member was killed by an armed group while she was on her way to work west of Baghdad a roadside bomb exploded in Al-Musayyab south of Baghdad injuring three police officers two mortar shells landed on an Iraqi army checkpoint in a Rashad town south of Kirkuk, killing two soldiers and injuring three others. Meanwhile, the Iraqi government released 12 Iraqi prisoners in Baghdad and more than 60 others in Baquba in an attempt to advance the national reconciliation campaign. <laughs> Public demonstrations in the Palestinian territories are growing day by day. New sectors of society are joining these demonstrations due to the deteriorating living conditions and due to the fact that government employees have not received their salaries for the seventh consecutive month. Hundreds of police and security forces have joined in the demonstrations, going out to the streets and closing off the major roads in Gaza, preventing cars from commuting between the southern and northern parts of the Gaza Strip. They are demanding to be paid. Their patience has run thin because the Palestinian police did not fulfill its promise to pay its employees one month's salary before the month of Ramadan. Palestinian security officers went out to the street six days after the holy month began, not to hold a demonstration, rather to close major roads and paralyze movement throughout Gaza. Forces from different security agencies were deployed in the streets to prevent citizens from driving their cars with the object of exerting pressure on the responsible parties. This demonstration was held because we were not paid yesterday as promised. Yesterday we did not get paid at all. This is the whole story. Cars are not allowed to pass through. You driving the Pijo car, come back. We are protesting because we were not paid. The people are starving. What else can we say? During the month of Ramadan, we cannot buy anything. We do not know what to do. Palestinian security forces are protesting their living conditions that have deteriorated since they stopped receiving their salaries seven months ago. This comes as Palestinian citizens are feeling resentful because the talks between establishing a unity government between Fatah and Hamas derailed and the gap between the two groups is widening. This explains why some citizens are pointing the finger at everybody. I blame both sides. I blame all the Palestinians people. I do not only hold Fatah or Hamas responsible, I hold all the Palestinian people responsible. They must sit down and reach an agreement with one another so that this can end.
تمكن المحتجزون. Palestinian security forces managed to close off the major roads linking the northern and southern parts of the Gaza Strip, thus paralyzing the entire area. It seems that these demonstrations will escalate if Hamas and Fatah fail to form a national unity government. Saif al-Din Shaheen, Al-Arabiya Television, Gaza. Prime Minister Ehud Olmert says he rejected so-called Syrian peace overtures. Speaking to Israel Radio, Olmert accused Damascus of harboring Palestinian terrorists. Talks with Syrian President Bashar Assad are impossible, said Olmert, as long as Hamas and other terrorist groups operate out of the Syrian capital. Turning to the Palestinian front, Olmert said that he hopes to meet PA Chairman Mahmoud Abbas in the coming days. At the same time, the Prime Minister insisted that Palestinian security prisoners will not be freed until captured soldier Gilad Shalit is released. On the Lebanese front, Omer said that he does not foresee another violent conflict with Hezbollah in the near future. He credited the IDF with changing the reality in Lebanon and making it impossible for Hezbollah to engage in any fighting beyond local border skirmishes. The Prime Minister also cautioned that Israel can expect to be tested by the Syrians in the near future. Prime Minister Olmert and Defense Minister Peretz will meet today for the first time with members of the Vinograd Committee looking into the shortcomings of the war in Lebanon. They will attend separate meetings described as background talks and are not considered testimony. If the rockets continue to fall in the Western Galilee, Israel may be forced to step up its battle against the terror infrastructure in the Gaza Strip. That was the word from Defense Minister Amir Peretz, who hinted at a possible massive incursion deep inside Palestinian territory. In an exclusive interview, Peretz told the Jerusalem Post that the Qassams must be stopped at any price. Peretz said Hamas must be placed under enough pressure so that the terror attacks and rocket fire will stop. If not warned the Defense Minister, Israel may have no choice but to conquer all of Gaza to stop it from turning into a second Lebanon. An Israeli airstrike in the Gaza Strip before dawn targeted the home of a weapons dealer. Palestinian security sources report that two missiles destroyed a home in Rafah near the Egyptian border. Two people were reportedly injured in that strike. Before the operation, residents were instructed to evacuate the building. The army says the house was targeted because it was being used to cover up a tunnel for smuggling weapons from Egypt. PA Deputy Prime Minister Nasser al shayeh was released last night from prison after spending a month in detention. The leading Hamas official was seized in an IDF raid on August 19th when he was grabbed from his hiding place in an underground cave in Ramallah. The Shayeh went into hiding after the army detained the group of Hamas leaders following the June kidnapping of IDF Corporal Gilad Shalit. 34 other members of Hamas, including four cabinet ministers, remain in jail. Media reports say that the Palestinian legislators may be freed as part of a prisoner exchange for Corporal Shalit. Uh, I, I should be free from the first minute, I know, but I don't know why now. I don't know what they need from me, I don't know. But anyway, anyway, I'll uh, uh, go back again to my job, to my work, to my government, and I'll do my best uh, uh, to serve and help my people. Uh. Major General Gadi Eisenkot will be the new head of the Northern Command. The appointment was approved last night by Defense Minister Amir Peretz. Eisenkot will replace Major General Udi Adam, who announced his resignation two weeks ago following differences of opinion with IDF Chief of Staff Lieutenant General Dan Khalutz during the war in Lebanon. Eisenkot has spent most of his military career in the Golani Brigade, which he commanded from 1997 to 1998. The 46-year-old Major General served as a military attaché to former Prime Minister Ehud Barak. Eisenkot received an Army and Security degree from the U.S. Military College. The new head of the Northern Command will be faced with the challenges of handling the IDF's withdrawal from Lebanon, as well as the Army's relationship to the contingents of international peacekeepers from UNIFIL.
meanwhile is filing a complaint with the United Nations Security Council over Israel's failure to withdraw from southern Lebanon. As according to a Lebanese official speaking on condition of anonymity to AFP, Israel is not pulling out. It is altering the border fence, stealing Lebanese water in the Wazani and territory and are violating Lebanese airspace. Meanwhile, Israel's prime minister said he did not expect another fight with Hezbollah in the near future. And Israel's defense ministry named Major General Gadi Izenko as head of the Northern Command, who is replacing Major General Udi Adam, who resigned amid charges of incompetence in waging the war against Hezbollah. More in this report. Disputes over how the Lebanese army and UN peacekeepers will deal with Hezbollah fighters is allegedly holding up the withdrawal of Israeli troops from Lebanon. Israel's military chief of staff, Dan Howard, said at this stage Israel is delaying the transfer of the territory until an agreement is reached. Always pointing the finger at others and not themselves, Howard said Israelis considered any use of military equipment, including intelligence gathering, means which are not of the Lebanese army or UNIFIL, or violations of resolution. 1701. Halitz was quoted by officials in the cabinet meeting yesterday as saying he has ordered soldiers to shoot Lebanese stone throwers along the border if they feel their lives are in danger. Israeli cabinet ministers at yesterday's weekly meeting were outraged over a protest Friday in which several dozen Hezbollah supporters on the Lebanese side of the border threw stones at soldiers on the Israeli side of the border. Some of the ministers criticized the army for not responding to the protest. But Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert brushed off the threat of stone-throwing demonstrators, saying none of the group's fighters are wandering around South Lebanon armed. But ministers failed to stress on their state's own violation, as they have not only delayed their withdrawal once again, but Israeli troops have set up checkpoints inside Marwahin. The Lebanese army said Israeli troops set up a checkpoint on the main road and checked the identities of drivers. It added that on Tuesday, the Israeli forces questioned journalists and residents. The Israeli army continues to occupy 10 positions in southern Lebanon. Israeli violations did not stop there. Lebanese officials and residents of the south accused the Israeli army of stealing water from the Wazani border river. Mohammad Ramlouch, the engineer heading the Wazani river pumping systems, told the AFP the Israeli army sabotaged the water pumps on the river last week and installed a pipe to pump hundreds of cubic meters to Israel. And even though its troops withdrew from parts of southern Lebanon, Israel continued to kill innocent civilians with submunitions it left behind. The latest victim is a nine-year-old boy. Mohammed Hassan Sultan was instantly killed when a cluster bomb exploded near his house in the village of Sawanih. Three men were also wounded in the explosion. Separately, a 36-year-old woman was wounded in another cluster bomb explosion. How do the steadfast residents of southern Lebanon spend their days during the month of Ramadan? A report by our colleague Samir Ghazi in Maruna Ras. This is Marun Aras, standing up tall. It is a small border town which became known during the confrontation with Israel. It became one of the most famous towns. However, experiences of aggression have changed its features. So we needed a sign to direct us where to go. We were drawn to a home which we believed represented the steadfastness of the people during the war and after it. We reached our destination. Our only mission was to find out how this family is living in this devastated village during the holy month of Ramadan. A missile landed here. It came from the settlement and hit the wall. It hit here and caused this damage. It seems that you didn't have any windows. We have fixed things a little bit. But where else can we go? There's nothing we can do. My family lives with my sister's family. There are four members in my family as well as my sister and her husband. Six people. Where are we going to go? There is nothing we can do. The kitchen here is freezing at night, especially for the kids. The cats keep coming inside. My mother closed this small area. The wall is not stable. It could fall down at any time. Are you preparing your breakfast meal? We made green beans and olive oil, kebabs, 
fried pepper. That's done it, Lee. Potatoes and fatouche salad. Shorba. Those are the essential dishes. Soup, stuffed cabbage, and stuffed grape leaves. Here is the fatouche salad. God willing, you will like it. Do you like fatouche or not really? Yes, it is an essential dish. Yes, but its vegetables have become warm. How much does it cost to make that? 3,000 liras. Thank God, because there is no lettuce. We can't find any lettuce. There is no water. Our land was burned. I almost was burned as well. Missiles were landing on us. We don't want to reach a state of hopelessness. May God make us strong. The meal was all prepared. The family gathered around the food, waiting for the call to the sunset prayers. The time to break the fast arrived, so we remained with the family. We joined them in eating their modest meal. After we ate, the time came to drink southern tea, which induced the family members to express their heart's worries. We lost all of our crops. We do not have anything. The season for tobacco leaves and olives were lost. The olive trees were all burned. To begin with, the economic conditions were already difficult. At this two or three months without any production, no government representative has come to see us yet or ask what is happening with us. We have been receiving aid from relief agencies, but what can these agencies do? Can they put our children through school or put clothes on them? What are you asking the government to do during Ramadan so that you can at least make it through the month? We just want them to fix our house, nothing more. That is the most important thing right now. We don't want the rain season to come when we are still in these conditions. These are young kids and it's cold, just as you see. If it is like this before the winter, then what will it be like when the rain falls? We can't put rugs on the floor because water will get inside the house. Or if a child gets a fever, we can't take him to the hospital. If we could hardly continue this interview without putting on more clothes to keep from getting cold, then how would this family, amidst these difficult conditions, face the extremely cold weather season that is approaching just around the corner? From Maroon Aras village, Samir Ghazi, New TV. New TV. Iran and the European Union closed the second day of negotiations on Iran's nuclear case in Berlin, with the two sides calling the talks constructive. At the close of the meeting Thursday, EU Foreign Policy Chief Javier Solana called for a continuation of the negotiations. We have been uh, progressing. We have made some uh, progress, important progress on the elements of how the potential negotiation can take place. Yes, still, so there are some issues that are important that have not been closed. But we will maintain uh, ourselves in touch. I hope that uh, in the middle of the week we will have uh, a contact, uh, maybe telephonic, but we have a contact because we want to maintain uh, the level of, of, of contact that we have had. Top Iranian nuclear negotiator Elil Larajani in turn said two days of talks with the EU foreign policy chief Javier Solana have produced some positive conclusions. Different areas, different discussions, and we have been able to arrive at some positive conclusions. These talks would be continued. Today we talked about the modalities of the negotiation, and almost we have come to conclusion. Meanwhile, cultivation of bilateral economic and political ties took the center stage in talks between Larajani and German Foreign Minister Frank Walter Steinmeier. Larajani, currently in Berlin, described his travel to Germany as fruitful and said Iran is seeking security 
in the region. As for Iran's nuclear program, the two sides agree diplomacy is the only way out of the standoff. The restart of nuclear talks between Iran and Europe in defiance of pressures by Washington to sideline negotiations has drawn an immediate reaction from the White House. In a fresh move, the United States State Department spokesman has said talks between Europe's big three in China and Russia with Iran will get off to a swift start. Sean McCormack told reporters the resumption will not deliver a setback to the consensus in the international community, which has bridged a gap in Iran's issue and now speaks with one voice. He further says Salada is representing the U.S. and its fellow members in the 5 plus 1 group as he talks the nuclear question with Tehran. Earlier, McCormick had told Secretary Rice if Iran is given time, it may respond positively and offer, as Mokland's put it, one the tentative blessing of Rice, providing that some changes could emerge in the negotiating table. The U.S. diplomat continued to bid would put off a U.S. push for imposing sanctions on Iran. In Saudi, the Ministry of Islamic Affairs, Endowment, Dawah, and Guidance in Coordination with the Ministry of Culture and Information has begun the project of transmitting live translations of the Tarawih prayers in the noble Al-Haram Mosque and Prophet's Mosque into both the English and French languages. Details from our correspondent, Hassan Atalai from Jeddah. Two years ago, in coordination with the Ministry of Culture and Information, the religious authority in charge of the Al-Haram and the Prophet's mosques, the Ministry of Islamic Affairs, Endowment, Dawah and Guidance, began to implement a project to broadcast live translations of the Tarawih prayers from the Al-Haram Mosque in the holy city of Mecca, as well as the Prophet's Mosque in Medina. This project underwent considerable development and change in order to avoid previous years' mistakes. حصل بعض إعادة الترتيب بالنسبة للترجمة Last year, the translations were reviewed and this blessed project was reorganized. Thank God, this year, the project was launched and it was better than in previous years. The prayers at the Al-Haram Mosque are translated into English and the prayers at the Prophet's Mosque are translated into French in real time and simultaneously. With with these translations, the ministry is trying to communicate the meaning of the Holy Quran to Muslims throughout the world, especially those who do not speak the Arabic language. This is done to convey the moderate interpretations of the Holy Quran for all people. The ministry has reached the conclusion that Muslims need the translations in additional languages. So God willing, we will implement a project to translate into additional languages. The live translations from the two holy mosques are unique for their easy and clear language and their supplications, which come from the Holy Quran. The translations demonstrate a commitment to the Salafi tradition by accurately translating the Quranic verses as well as the religious concept. All this is done by the members of the translation team, which includes four people. Two people translate simultaneously during the prayers and the others review the translations. This team has very good qualifications, both in terms of memorizing the Holy Quran and through their broad knowledge of the English and French languages. They are also very capable of working with a subtitling program and can simultaneously translate what the Sheikh reads. The project of offering simultaneous translations during the Tarawih prayers is a beneficial experience which has achieved its objectives, the enjoyment of watching the Tarawih prayers on television. The project to provide live translations of the Tarawih prayers in two languages, English and French, is being done so that non-Arab Muslims as well as non-Muslims can learn about this religion and its great principles through the translated meanings of the Holy Quran. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. Please visit linktv.org backslash mosaic for more information about these broadcasters or to view previous Mosaic programs, obtain program transcripts, or receive the weekly Mosaic Intelligence Report. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedall Foundation.
the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, and by committed Link TV viewers like you. If you value this program, please send your tax-deductible contribution to Link TV, either through the website or the mailing address listed on your screen. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.